Hey everybody, today we're going to read another first chapter. This book is a young adult book by Garth Nix, who's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite authors. It is called The Left-Handed Booksellers of London. And actually this one has a prologue, which is pretty good for a first chapter, so we're going to read that instead of the actual first chapter. Um, there is a little note at the beginning of the book. It says, this story takes place in a version of England in the year 1983 but it is not entirely as those who were alive then will remember, or those with a historical bent can check up on, but which is real. So it's like an alternate history kind of thing, but it's also fantasy. So this is the prologue. It was 5.42 a.m. on May Day, 1983, in the west of England, and a sliver of the sun had edged above the ridge. But it was still cool and almost dark in the shallow valley, where the brook ran clear and straight until it made a sweeping left-hand curve before the weir a mile farther downstream. A bridge of three planks crossed the brook near a farmhouse, carrying the footpath to the farther side, diverting walkers away. Not that this path was ever well-traveled. Walkers somehow failed to see the start of this particular path under the ancient oak next to the crossroad at the hamlet near the weir. A young woman came out of the farmhouse, yawning, her eyes half shut, her mind still mostly lost in a dream that had seemed so real. Susan Arkshaw, who had turned 18 years old as of two minutes ago, was striking rather than immediately attractive, with her vibrant black eyebrows in stark contrast to her closely razored head, the stubble-dyed white blonde. She wore a 1968 Jimi Hendrix summer tour t-shirt given to her mother 15 years ago by a roadie. The t-shirt was big enough to serve as a nightdress because she was not tall, though very wiry and muscular. People often thought she was a professional dancer or gymnast, though she was neither. Her mother, who was tall and slight without the muscle, said Susan took after her father, which was possibly true. Susan had never met him, and this was one of the few details her mother had ever shared. Susan walked to the brook and knelt to dip her hand in the cool, clear water. She'd had the recurring dream again, familiar since her childhood. She frowned, trying to recall it in more detail. It always started the same way here at the brook. She could almost see it. A disturbance in the water suggested a fish rising at first, until it became a great roiling and splashing too big for any fish. Slowly, as if drawn up by an invisible rope, a creature rose from the heart of the swift current in the middle of the brook. Its legs and arms and body were made from weed and water, willow sticks and reeds. Its head was a basket shaped of twisted alder roots, with orbs of swirling water as limpid eyes, and its mouth was made of two good-sized crayfish, claws holding tails, crustacean bodies forming an upper and lower lip. Bubbling and streaming clear cold water, the creature sloshed a dozen yards across the grass and then stone paving to the house, and raising one long limb lashed green willow ends upon window glass once, twice, three times. The crayfish mouth moved, and a tongue of pondweed emerged to shape words, wet and sibilant. I watch and ward. The river creature turned and, walking back, lost height and girth and substance, until in the last few paces it became little more than a bundle of stuff such as the brook might throw ashore in the flood. The only sign of its presence a trail of mud upon the flagstone path that lined the front of the house. Susan rubbed her temples and looked behind her. There was a trail of mud on the flagstones, from house to brook. But her mother had probably gotten up even earlier and had been pottering about, shuffling in her gumboots. A raven cawed from the rooftop. Susan waved to it. There were ravens in her dream as well, but bigger ones, much larger than any that actually existed, and they talked as well, though she couldn't remember what they said. She always remembered the beginning of the dream best. It got confused after the brook creature. Besides the ravens, there was also something about the hill above the farmhouse. A creature emerged from the earth there, a kind of lizard thing of stone, possibly even a dragon. Susan smiled, thinking about what all this meant. Her subconscious hard at work, fantasizing, fueled by too many fantasy novels and a childhood diet of Susan Cooper, Tolkien, and C.S. Lewis. The brook creature and the huge ravens and the earth lizard should all make up a nightmare, but the dream wasn't frightening. Quite the reverse, in fact. She always felt strangely comforted after she had the dream. She yawned hugely and went back to bed. As she crawled under her duvet and sleep claimed her again, she suddenly remembered what one of the huge ravens had said in the dream. 
Gifts your father gave us, we creatures of water, air, and earth, to watch and ward. My father, said Susan sleepily, my father. Later, when her mother brought her tea and toast in bed at eight o'clock, a special treat to celebrate her birthday, Susan had forgotten her earlier awakening, had forgotten she'd had the recurring dream again. But something lingered. She knew she'd dreamed. She looked at her mother sitting on the end of her bed. I had an interesting dream last night, I think, only I can't remember what happened. It seemed important. It's good to dream, said her mother, who lived much in a dream herself. She ran her fingers through her long, luxuriantly black hair, streaked here and there with the white of grief, not age. Jasmine never let anyone cut her hair. She became very agitated when Susan suggested she do more than trim the ends, which she did herself. Most of the time, but there are bad dreams, too. I think my dream, I think it was somehow about my father. Oh, yes, more tea. Are you sure you can't tell me who my father is, Mum? Oh, no. It was a different time. I wasn't the same person. He... Did you say yes to more tea? Yes, Mum. They drank more tea, both lost in their own thoughts. Eventually, Susan said with some determination, I think I'll go up to London early, get acclimatized. There's bound to be pub work I can get, and I... I'll try to find my dad. What was that, darling? I'm going to go up to London before I take my place. Just find some work and so on. Oh, well, it's natural, I suppose. But you must be careful. He told me... No, that was about something else. Who is he? What did he say to be careful of or about? Hmm? Oh, I forget. London, yes, of course you must go. When I was 18, I couldn't imagine being anywhere else. But I insist on postcards. You must send me postcards. Trafalgar Square. Susan waited for Jasmine to continue, but her mother's voice trailed off and she was staring at the wall. Whatever thought had been about to emerge lost somewhere along the way. I will, Mum. And I know you will be careful. Eighteen. Happy birthday, my darling. Now, I must get back to my painting before that cloud comes over and ruins the light. Presents later, okay? After second breakfast. Presents later. Don't miss the light. No, no. You too, darling girl. Even more so for you. Be sure to stay in the light. That's what he would have wanted. Mom, who's he? Oh, come back. Oh, never mind. And that is the prologue of the left-handed booksellers of London.